I was there in church when we would talk about, oh, women should not divorce their husbands because this marriage is for life. And of course, I still advocate for people to stay if you know that is the right thing and if you know that's what your heart wants. But if you know for sure, and nobody can tell another one this, but when you know in that place, my advice to you is take your very first next step, whatever that step is. Welcome to the Thriving After Divorce Podcast, where you learn the secrets to reclaim your life and turn your breakup into your breakthrough. Transformation expert, internationally published author, and online show host Tanya Marie Dubé will help you quickly pick up and move on as you tune into interviews with some pretty cool experts from around the world, showing you how to live your best life after divorce. If you're ready to learn the skills to finally put your divorce behind you for good, dig down really deep, and step into your highest self, then you're in the right place. Here's your host, online educator and mom of two, Tanya Marie Dubé. Hi, everybody. It's Monday morning. How was everyone's weekend? I am so happy that you're here with me in the space once again. I would love to remind you to please like, comment, subscribe, share, and review this podcast. As some of you may know, my online video series reached over 300,000 women all over the world. And my goal with this podcast is to reach 1 million women globally. So with your help, I know we can do this. When you teach a woman, you teach an entire community and the love just spreads. So please share this with your community and let's reach this goal together. So today's interview is with Mary Nemente. She is a clinical psychologist, a former Franciscan nun, and the founder and CEO of Success Coach LLC. This is a company that is dedicated to creating a worldwide movement called Worthiness Now to help people prosper in all areas of their lives. She is passionate about helping you reconnect with yourself, with your higher power or God or the universe, and to know that your worthiness does not depend on anything you'll ever do or not do. So we go deep in this episode, girl. We talk a lot about worthiness and self-love, how people-pleasing runs really deep. We talk about how easy it is to live a life in such a way that you're doing such a superb job hiding from who you really are, which is what got me locked in with the wrong man several times in my life, which some of you may understand because of your own experience. Lastly, I love what Mary has to say around the topic of shame and guilt. Now, I don't think you're going to want to miss this episode. My hope for you is that you hear a message and something we've talked about that helps to change the course of your life for the better. So let's welcome Mary. Hi, Mary. I'm so happy you're here with me today. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you. How are you? I'm really well. Thank you. As you know, my day's been busy jumping from thing to thing. I just came back from pizza lunch with about 200 grade twos and grade three year old kids. (laughs) <laughs> and it was a lot of fun. I don't know if you've ever done something like this, but you jump into this room. It was a pizza lunch, right? So you get these stacks of pizza and you got to pull them all apart and be ready because when the kids walk through the door, it's grade two, grade three, I think maybe even grade one, but they all come rushing in and they just want pizza and they're ravenous. <laughs> it's just mayhem. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been in a children's pizza lunch, but I've been at work when we have pizza for lunch. Is it the same? And when Rav- you open it up and it's that smell <laughs> goes through, everybody's like, Yes, pizza. Yeah. That's what we want. <laughs> I'm imagining the same thing, but with adults. They all just come yeah. running or just <laughs> screaming and reaching for pizza. Okay, so let's jump into our interview today. You ready to get going? I am. Okay, so let's start out with tell us about you. What what do you do now and what led you to the work that you do today? Gosh, I do several I do two things particularly now. I work in private practice with clients who want to do therapy for different things like relational issues, family of origin problems, trauma, and my favorite is working with people who have trauma or who have experienced some trauma in their lives and helping them to recover. Mm -hmm. And this year I started my coaching business online where I am doing work, especially with people and especially women who are entrepreneurs, who are creating businesses or who are healers and really helping people 
especially women who give and give until they hurt in their bones, Mm -hmm. but they can't stop giving because they feel guilty or anxious when they are not giving all the time. And I know this is a big deal because I experienced it in my life. And what I really help them do is to set clear boundaries for themselves so that they can enjoy their work and so that they can really be able to help their clients to get good results and make good money doing what they're doing. Mm. And the reason I'm so passionate about this aspect of it is because I know that overgiving is an extension of the the struggle with worthlessness, never feeling like what we do is enough. Mm -hmm. And I went through this in my own life and I'm the process of healing it. And I think I've come a long way and I have a lot to share with people around it, especially women. You know, um, what stands out to me is that, like for me personally in my own life, when I was younger, I used to be a massive people pleaser. And I found my self-worth was tied to being able to show up for other people. And if if that was taken away from me, my self-worth wasn't uh, wasn't as intact as it should have been. Because I put everything into helping other people all the time, putting myself at the very back of all of that, no matter what the cost. So that kind of sounds a little bit like this to me as well. Oh my goodness, you are hitting the nail on the head. Mm -hmm. That's exactly how I experienced it. I was a nun for 25 years and my day consisted of waking up sometimes at 4 a.m., giving, giving, giving till 6 p.m. until 9 p.m. And I learned just by that lifestyle that my worth was all about what I could do for other people. And it was great because it was service, What I didn't really learn and what wasn't emphasized or even looked into was helping me to know who I was and to really value who I was. So I felt like I was giving and giving and giving nonstop. And then I started to resent people, you know, Mm, I didn't like them much. I was complaining like they don't, they're not appreciative. They don't show that they see the value of what I'm doing. And it was so painful. Mm-hmm. And it's mostly, I find that it's mostly because we attach, we attach something to the outcome, right? So when we're doing all of these things for other people, we're attaching something to the outcome, which is love me. Yes. Yes. It's like yeah. I'm extending the right hand and my left hand is waiting. Like, yeah. can you just see that what I give you is looking good enough. And can you just see that and then see that I'm good enough? And of yeah. course, other people can't really meet such an expectation. Yeah. And it- that need for validation is strong. Yes. Yeah. Now, I, I love that you used to be a nun. I think that's fascinating. We talked so much about this on the phone. Did you want to tell us what led you to become a nun? Because I think I, I, love, I love your story. <laughs> so I grew up in a family. My mother was in church goer, but my, my father was and really loved church and And so at some point, the combination of the two of them, one being skeptical of church and the other being really church oriented and from a really small village, church was like the big deal of the town. So all of us kids went to church, we got baptized. And so God and church and life in the Christian community was what I knew growing up. And then I moved to a bigger town to live with my older sister and her husband was a catechist. So I was again, just immersed in church and prayer and service and doing things for other people, going to hospital visits, visiting old people, taking care. So in some ways, it just was like part of me growing up, doing things for others. And then, of course, as going to Catholic school, we had nuns and priests coming to us every year and talking about Vocations Week. And it sounded so great. It was like something I was already doing naturally. I could have a lifetime career of doing it, you know, just felt Mm -hmm. natural. So I went into it with the enthusiasm to serve, to take care. And by 19, when I finished high school, I was so ready. My mother was crying like, please, I need your help. I was like, "Mm, the people will need more help than you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I went to the convent. And so I spent all my young adult life and most of my adult life as a nun doing something that I started doing from when I was growing up and it felt wonderful. And I had some great opportunities there to do leadership work, do training, travel the world, take care of so many things. But as I, as I grew older, I realized there was more to me 
and just pouring my heart away and feeling depleted. Mm -hmm. So I decided that I would try something else. I wanted to be happy because to me, that was always the core of everything I was doing. And I thought I was, but I started reflecting in my older years and realized I wasn't fully being as happy as I looked. That must have been a very scary but interesting crossroad for you. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> right? So scary. I thought I was going to die. Because <laughs> mm-hmm. now you're faced with, with a whole bunch of other stuff that you put underneath all of that, right? Remember we talked about that on the phone when we're hiding from yeah. who we really are? Let's talk a little bit about that and how that played a role in all of this. Oh, my God. Part of the hiding for me was hearing that people would find out that I came from this home where my father was my uncle. I didn't have a dad. My mother was a single parent. And there was just, and we were poor, you know? And I just Mm -hmm. wanted my family to look pristine and clean. And Mm -hmm. I didn't want anybody to know anything about it. So that was one thing I was already hiding about myself feeling very ashamed of it, participating in church, but always being found out when there were key moments like uh, confirmation, when you'd be like, who is your father? Where is your this? Where is, and I was like, oh no, don't ask me the question. <laughs> yeah, because you know it's coming. And as a child, you're like, oh gosh, yes. don't pick me, don't pick me. <laughs> don't pick me, don't ask me. I don't know what to answer. I don't know what to say. And then sometimes they'll be like, oh yeah, because you're not legitimate pa- uh, children, your mom has to do some extra work so that she can atone for you. And I'll just be like, I didn't understand anything, mm-hmm. except I felt so much shame. I don't know if you remember, but one of the things that you and I bonded over was that we had a very similar, we had a very similar childhood that way. And that I also don't know my father and I had to go through all of the same things as you. And I grew up in foster care which made it even worse. <laughs> I mean, the foster family was, was the most amazing thing that ever happened to me. But, but to say that out loud and to, to stand out like that among all of the other kids is a very hard thing to do. And like you, I grew up inside of the church. It was a very safe place for me to be. And my relationship to God meant everything to me. So yeah, yeah I, remember, I remember our conversation got very deep around this topic because it's so meaningful. Oh my goodness, that relationship with God, that's the best part of my experience in the convent growing up the way I did. Mm. Because even though I, I, I could hide from other people, I was so ashamed of myself in front of other people. I had this private place in my heart that I could go to, even when I was in church and even feeling ashamed and knew that I was seen by God, I was heard by God, I was understood by God. But then there was this conflict. Why, oh God, did you burden me with so much? Mm -hmm. So I was really like crying out from the deepest parts of myself to God. And at the same time, I was feeling very supported, very encouraged, very valued by God. And so it kept me going. And so when I had to leave the convent, that was the worst part of the whole story. I remember this specific time and place when I allowed the words to go through, to form and to go through my mind. I was going to leave and I cried out like, oh my God, I can do that. <sighs> yeah. That God would punish me. All I could think of is if I left, I was disappointing God based on the God that I had been told and taught to worship and adore that God wanted me to do what I was told to do by other people. And so it felt like saying no to this life that God had called me to was saying no to God and God was going to be angry and to do something. And in that moment, even though I was crying and so scared out of my own skin, what I said to myself was, God, if you truly want to support me, and you are with me in this decision, you're going to prove it to me that you are with me every step of the way. And do you know what the proof was going to be? Mm, what? My body had been breaking apart already. So there were, I was pre-hypertensive. I was pre-diabetic. I was pre-cancer. <laughs> mm. And I had all this documentation to show for it. Like mm-hmm. I still have some of them with all these x-rays, of my left breast, of 
the blood test and everything. And so then I thought, okay, now God, either I just get really, really sick and die because I'm making this decision against you and you don't like it and you won't support me anymore. Or I walk this path with you and you're going to show me that you are with me every step of the way as I get well and get healthy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I didn't formulate it so clearly in my mind, but it was like the bar- barometer for me. It was like, okay, I'm here trying to do this God thing. It's not working for me. And mm-hmm. I see myself, my grave is close to me. And I knew that if I kept going, I was going to die. So I was like, okay, the only way I can come back from that grave is if God supported me. And this would be proof. My goodness, Mary, there are so many parallels between your relationship to God and leaving that God that you grew to know almost behind as you created a new relationship with yourself. The parallel between that and going through a divorce Mm -hmm. and being married to the man or woman that, you know, that you're, that you thought would be, you know, your essential everything for life and then starting over. So now what do you think, I mean, going through all of this, your experience for those people who I, I'm not a religious person now in my life, but I am very, very spiritual. Mm -hmm. But for those people who are connected to God in the way that you are, and they go through a divorce, which is very much against what they felt they should have been doing. What do you have to say to that? Oh my goodness. I just want to have every woman who is going through that. I, right now I'm holding my hand over my chest, just mm. over my heart. I say, hold your heart together. I was there in church when we would talk about, oh, women should not divorce their husbands because this marriage is for life. And of course, I still advocate for people to stay if you know that is the right thing. And if you know that's what your heart wants. But if you know for sure, and nobody can tell another one this, but when you know in that place where you know, my advice to you is take your very first next step, whatever that step is. Mm-hmm. It's going to feel like you're going to die. The fear of God, just the God self. It's like the God we are taught in that setting. is like, if you do something wrong, God is going to punish you. And it corresponds very well with the law. If you do something wrong, there's going to be consequences. And that is a God that we grow up with, at least for Christians. If you're the kind of Christian I was, a Catholic Christian, I believe that you would be very close to what I'm saying or be aware that this is a type of indoctrination or the beliefs we grow up in, at least that was for me. Mm-hmm. And I'm saying, when you know what you know, trust that the God that you were told about cares about you uniquely. I don't believe that God cares about doctrine more than he cares about the people. Oh, me too. Oh my goodness. I love what you just said. I absolutely agree with you. Thank you. Thank you. I am so passionate about this because I have experienced it in my flesh and blood that the God that I was told in church was a God like, I don't know, even if it's a God that was good for children, but it's a God that you can outgrow. It's a God that you have to outgrow in order to embrace God. Right. You can't sit with that God. And I was a nun. I was taught theology. I was taught exegesis of the Bible. I was taught all kinds of things. But they were still as limiting as anything I've ever come across. Because I was so hungry to connect with God. I was so hungry to breathe like God, to love like God, to be compassionate like God. And I knew I I could because I thought that was the reason I was alive. But nothing in the structure allowed me to come close enough to this experience. It led me there. I was on the path, but I realized I was always going to be on the path and never get there. And I was like, what's the point? Mm. So if you are thinking, if you are living with a partner that you've given your heart and soul to, I hear you, sister, and I hear you. I don't know exactly how your own pain is, but I hear you from the perspective of what I did with my life. I gave it my all. I knew that come rain, come sun, come whatever, for life, for sickness, for death, I was going to be there. 
And I know that most people who are married are in this space where they have made these vows and where they live truly from them. But don't forget, God has more from you than just the vows you offer. God is, I have experienced that God wants my heart and soul to be so happy, to be so full of joy and compassion that anything that gets in the way of it, I am free to step aside or to let the thing step aside and to keep moving in that direction. And I say, give yourself the freedom. Nobody will give it to you. You have to, your, your partner will not, your children will not, your family will not, the priest will not, no constitution will. You have to do it yourself. And tell me what can it boil down to when I leave this world on that last day, which I know I will do and you will do and everyone will. Mm. I just want it to be able to say, I did it how I knew it needed to be done. And I'm satisfied that I did it. Wow. I knew that moment will be my moment and nobody will be there to intervene. I love the theme of that entire thing that you just said is all about how much more in control we actually are than we actually think we are. Mm -hmm. And you're heavily guided by your intuition, which is another way of saying you're connected to God. Yes. Oh my goodness. Thank you. I love how you get it. Every time I'm talking to you, I like it. <laughs> I know we have great conversations. I love talking to you. I love talking to you so much. Yes, I believe that you do. That intuition is that lifeline to God. It's so quiet. It's, I know there's a passage in the Bible, I don't remember the name. The strong breeze came and God was not in it. And hell came and God was not in it. And thunder came and God was not in it. And it was a gentle breeze. There, God's voice came through. That is that intuition. Mm. At the time, I used to picture it outside of myself in some unknown mountain place where mm-hmm. God. I didn't realize that text was talking about that gentle whisper. And to and to get to that place, you need. Oh my goodness! I feel like the answer has been so obvious my entire life, and I just missed it. But. I think it's just in getting really quiet and very introspective. Ask the right questions if you want the right answers. Oh my God. Talk mm-hmm. about the right question. Ask, I have heard some speakers online talk about high value questions. You know, not asking the question like, how will God punish me if I do this? I think that is like a low value question as far as intuition, but really listening. What is God desiring for me that I'm refusing to give to myself? Wow, that is a good question. Because I really do believe as I've come to do this journey that God desires for me to be healthy, to be happy, to enjoy my life. And it doesn't mean things have to be simple. It does mean every moment to me, Tanya, that I'm asking, what is God desiring for me in this moment that I'm not giving to myself? I'm not allowing God to let it through. This morning I was laying in my bed and as when I wake up, first thing in the morning, I open my eyes and my mind is going a thousand miles an hour trying to figure out the day. And I bring it down, I rein it in. And this morning it was going and I rented in and all of a sudden, what did I realize? I realized my mind was getting anxious about something that happened yesterday that I can't talk about here right now, but I think everyone can really benefit from hearing this part of it. I was thinking, oh my God, I have to say everything perfectly in order for God to protect me. And I realized, oh my God, God is giving me protection even when I am not saying the perfect words. And as I realized this, I relaxed. I felt my body inside just relaxed. And I was like, oh, God is desiring for me to take refuge in God's protection, care, nurture, and compassion for me, even when I'm not speaking the right words, Mm -hmm. even if I'm not able to be perfect the way I want to be. But I was holding myself up in these anxious thoughts, 
because I was like, oh, God can only take care of me if I do it right, if I say it right, if I, if I give right. I still catch myself in this moment. And I find that relaxation inside to me is like another part of the intuition, like the bodily part saying, oh, yes, you just heard what God is hearing for you. Leave your head, hear the loving God in you. And I was so grateful I did because I was like, I just relaxed. And I was like, this is so good. This feels so great. Mm-hmm. And it's like the moment to moment thing to hear it, to, to intuit it and to trust it. So I heard it and then I came out and sat, I did other things. And then I sat down for my meditation and I still felt the anxiousness coming up. And I was like, okay, sometimes you will hear it and you will believe it. And sometimes you hear it, believe it, but it's hard to keep depending on the intensity of the situation. Mm-hmm. And then you have to just keep relaxing throughout the day keep relaxing throughout the day and really trusting. And to me, the the process of really getting to know God and intuition is a process of trusting. The more I have trusted, the more I have found out that my being is getting getting integrated. That oneness with God, that intuition that is God is more and more real. Real in comforting me, real in being there to show me what is the next best step to take, real in saying to me, you don't have to be perfect to be peaceful. <laughs> Isn't there a good lesson in that? Yeah. I wanted to say that when I, when I first left my marriage, I was, I was like, as you know, as most people know who are listening, I was married for almost married. Like, I mean, we moved in together immediately. So it was almost like we were married for the entire 18 and a half years we were together. And when I left, you know, we had done enough damage to each other. That was scary. But the worst part was now I was being faced with me having done this to myself, right? The things that I had put myself through by me marrying the wrong person and being in the wrong family, that was me doing things to myself. And at this point, I couldn't imagine what anybody could do that was worse to me than I had already done to myself. And it was because I was hiding. So thinking about this, when I left, I cried a lot. I cried a lot when I was by myself. The silence was palpable and I needed to go through this. And and one of the very first things that popped into my head when my eyes were closed was that I felt so alone. I felt so alone and by myself. And I immediately went into my childhood and remembered my relationship with God and remembered how I had been taught that I don't have to walk this life by myself. I'm not alone. And that I just have to give some faith into the idea that, that God is always with us. Whatever you feel God is, that is always there. And that that source is there for us to not just take from, but to also share in our experiences with. So in that moment, I imagined myself If you can picture me crying, my son used to leave all of his stuffies on my bed when he would go away for the weekend because he was worried about me being alone. And I'm a pretty tough girl. Like I don't show that stuff to my kids. Like when I'm really that upset about something, especially when it comes to my divorce, that's pretty private for me and I deal with it on my own. But anyway, as as a child, you know, he was four and five years old. He'd leave all of his stuffies, you know, all over my bed. So here I am crying, feeling so alone and lonely. And all I could do is imagine myself handing over the burden of what I was putting myself through into the hands of God. And and when I did that visualization, I felt like a weight literally lifted off of my shoulders. And and I didn't feel so so weighed down and so so hard on myself, right? Like that, that weight lifted. And so I, on a daily practice, I would imagine myself just handing this over to God, just hand it over to God, hand it over to God. And God's happy to take it from you and to hold on to it for you so that you can figure out all the other things that are going on. But gosh, Mary, was that ever a lifesaver for me? It really was. Oh, powerful. Thank you for sharing that. Oh, and your son, it just like melts my heart to see the little one, like putting stuff used to help Uh. (laughs) <laughs> even seeing that it's like God being there through this little person who doesn't yeah. know or even can understand what you're going through comfort mm. you and your visualization I do a lot of visualization work my core work with people is that visualization mm. the power of being able to see 
things that we are holding on to leave, like you say, hand over to God. I have seen that it, it, if you don't do it, you can't really appreciate what it is. Yeah. And I think part of it is that we, we see ourselves, we think, we always think in images, right? At least that's how I... Mm-hmm. Always. There's yeah. always imagery that goes with whatever we are living with or going through. And those images really anchor in what we are seeing and to see the lifting and to see it handing over to God and God taking over. I do this exercise with clients sometimes where I just say, put it into a balloon and let it go. Mm-hmm. You know, that's what you're saying to me. I'm even picking up on that, like those who believe in God, like see it lift up and let God receive. And you know what I also do for clients who are not spiritual and do not have that connection to God? I I asked them to do this entire exercise with somebody who meant something to them who's no longer with them or somebody who they know would want them to have a happy, peaceful, and joyful life. So maybe that's a grandmother. Maybe that's a grandfather. Maybe it's somebody down the line that you heard all these stories about and she was so strong and so brave. Yes. I have a feeling I mean, to to me, it feels kind of obvious, but I have a feeling that we are still so connected to every person in our lineage. So we're not by ourselves. Even if you don't believe in God, I think that you just have to remember that you're still, you're not alone. I mean, your entire DNA is structured from everybody who came before you. Oh, yes. I so believe the same thing. I have connected one of my most deeply personal mentor is Maya Angelou. I've never met Oh, I love Maya Angelou. I know. I've read every book she's written. You have. I could lay my hands on because like you say, I feel connected to her and we can connect to people that we read about, that we admire from a distance and just know that I feel the energy of these people, that they had compassion, they had love for life. Mm-hmm. And they have they heal through so much of similar things that we are going through. And how can they not connect to us? How can they not be longing for us to receive the same things that now they see better, they understand better, and they're willing to even help us on the journey that they already understand deeper than we do. So mm-hmm. I, I totally agree with you that anybody can connect to anyone's goodness if that's what you're longing for and you're looking for, you can connect to health, you can connect to whatever it is your heart is yearning for and know that it's already there. The thing that I found along the journey is that these things that at the beginning I was like, oh, poor me, God help me. At the end, I was like, oh God, you always had them. I just didn't know. (laughs) They were already there and you were desiring them. So hard for me. Mm -hmm. And wanting me to come over and see it. So really like letting go of the garbage, I think, so we can see the buffet of the abundance and the goodness is the whole process. And I think people who are going through divorce or any serious life shift and change, that letting the guilt go into the garbage can. Mm -hmm. And And this would be your work with trauma. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know that in my own experience with my, you know, what I went through in my life, not just my marriage, but everything I've ever been through has been deeply traumatic for me. And I just sort of thought, you know, I can do this on my own. I'm so strong. I'm a survivor. I've been through hard things before. I'm just going to plow through and go on to the next thing, which made it even worse. Because when you go through a divorce, it's almost like all the things you've never it's not almost like, it is like this. Everything you've never fully dealt with rises to the surface. And now you're not just dealing with your divorce, you're dealing with everything. Oh my God. It's so the tra- overwhelming. It's overwhelming. And the trauma is just sitting there. And, and you're sitting in the middle of all of that, which is why it feels even more devastating than it actually is, right? Yes, yes. If we didn't have all that trauma and everything coming together, it would be easy for anyone to make a change, right? Mm-hmm. We all know that change helps us to grow. Mm-hmm. But because there's so many other things that have happened that we just push through and we are so good. I, I don't know if you were, but I was the kind of person who was like, I can do it. Like you say, I can do it on my own. I have it better than most people. I shouldn't really be complaining. I have nothing to complain about. So I'll just get more forward. But the healing 
we need to stretch a hand out to someone. Oh my God, did I it, say- it, it has to happen because this is what I learned. What got me here is I don't have the tools to get me to where I need to go. I need somebody to help me do that. And I never thought that before. I remember very distinctly saying these words, and I hate putting this out to the universe because I don't feel like this anymore, but I used to say, I don't need anybody. I do not need another human being. And I really did feel like that. I don't feel like that anymore. I I understand the the need to um, reach down to help women up and to reach up to have other people help me. So I, I get the value in that now because at every stage where I'm feeling stuck or fearful or the shame or the guilt or the the rejection of life is weighing me down, that's my sign that I don't have the tools and I need to reach up constantly. Oh my God, I so relate to what you just said to me. I I grew from being this, I was like independent woman. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I was an independent woman, which meant I could solve everything myself. But as you say, the mindset, the belief system that has guided you up to this point is not enough to guide you where you want to go. Mm-hmm. That's a big change. And getting help can be really, really difficult because part of it is we've learned to be these people who take it in, hide it, smile at everybody, make everybody comfortable. Mm-hmm. Most people who go through divorce might relate to this. Where You've been this stronghold, holding it together. Whatever is going on, you're telling your family you're doing okay, it's good. And now you're faced with this situation where you have to say to people, well, it wasn't as okay as I thought it was going to be. <laughs> we are not used to saying that and meeting it to ourselves or let alone going out and say to someone who has the expertise, whether it's a life coach, whether it's a therapist, whether it's a family member, whether it's whoever has, even your doctor or whoever you can talk to that can give you some guidance about what to do. It's so hard to open the mouth and say, I have a real problem here. Mm. And not doing that is going to keep you spinning, spinning and spinning for so long. Yeah, because we're so attached to our belief systems, which are attached to everybody who's ever influenced us. And at some point when everything's not working, you have to ask yourself what part of those belief systems are actually yours and what belong to all the other people who you admired and who influenced your every thought and your every action. This is why when we when we get stuck like that and we have a hard time opening up or admitting to failure, which I really don't believe there's such a thing as failure, but when something doesn't work out the way society told you it should, you feel like a failure, you feel like you've done something wrong, or your age, you feel like your age is limiting you now and all your best years are behind you. These are all belief systems that you need to chuck out the door. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's it's very hard to do on your own, especially if you're already thinking about moving, getting the divorce done or separation or whatever. Because as you said earlier, everything comes up to the surface. And it's like, which one am I going to start with? (laughs) Sometimes it's like, oh, my God, I just I can't do anything because everything seems so much to be on the table. At the time when I was leaving the convent, I was like, my health was failing. I had no job. I was living in the U.S. I had no family. You know, it was just so much. Yeah. All at once. I didn't even know what to name. Yeah. It's like bobbing for apples. Mm-hmm. They're just all there and hitting you in the face. <laughs> yeah. You're like dodging this and dodging that. And then everything is triggering, you know, because yeah. The trauma reaction is such that your nervous system is so overwhelmed with a fight or flight reaction or hide. And it's like, you don't know which thing to start with. And if you don't look up and start with talking, trying to just get some words out there so your mind can start organizing things, it will be hard. So Mm -hmm. nobody should ever just say, "I, I don't know where to start. I don't know where to go. Talk to someone. Start somewhere. Invest in yourself. Part of it for me was I don't have the money because I didn't. I didn't have a penny somewhere in the world in my name. And that was me too. Yeah. Property or anything like that. And believe me, I was getting away from my, I cooked a lot of beans and rice and lentils. Mm. That's for my meals. That's what I was doing. Get a lot of 
beans, rice, lentils, and then some fruit, beans, rice, lentils, and then some fruit, save of whatever I could to pay to my therapist. <laughs> that was the same thing with me. A friend of mine said, just go through all of your things and whatever you're not using, sell it. Sell it on Kijiji or Craigslist or something because what, if you're not using it, it's just sitting there. This is money that you could be using to invest into yourself because that means something to me. Having a coach means something to me. Being able to buy these personal development books and courses means something to me because it's what's taken me so quickly out of my pain, which I was putting on myself, but I didn't realize that at the time took me out of all of that and put me into something much better. So now I'm in the service of other people. It's oh. a whole different life. And I believe me, when you go through stuff like what you and I are talking about, mm -hmm. you have so much to give to people, whether you're mm -hmm. giving it in a very specific service. It's now I'm realizing it. At the time, it was just to me like, who are you? You're so worthless. You, you don't have that much to give. You don't know this. You don't know that. And slowly and slowly, I started to realize, oh, no. When I told my story, people wanted to hear when I talked to people, they paid attention. It was like, oh my God, you saved my life. Oh my God, what you just said was important. And I was like, oh, that is, <laughs> oh, it is. I thought everybody knew that. And Isn't that. that so funny? The same, the same thing happened with me as well. You just start talking about your story and, and people, I mean, it's something that you live with forever. So you almost take it for granted. You know, it's your story for a long time. You're hiding from it. You're ashamed of it. You've got guilt around it, whatever it is. I mean, I hid from my story for a very long time, just like you did as a child. All of a sudden I start talking about it and people are really interested and yeah. really intrigued and, and probably have told you, you've come so far and you're so inspirational and look what you've done. And the whole time you were holding all of that inside. Yes. It almost feels selfish, doesn't it? Oh yeah. It is. <laughs> yeah. It's a selfishness that we don't know we are carrying. It's yeah. almost like the fear is a selfishness because when you really heal from the fear, then you realize your generosity is just being you, that you don't need to bring anything else. Your life, your story is a thing. I can't tell you how, much, how many people have said, write a book, we're going to read it. Um, <laughs> I love your energy. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> I have energy. <laughs> I have energy. All right. I have energy and I have a story. Okay. People were the ones who gave me the feedback to that gave me the courage to start stepping out, stepping up and saying and doing more to invite people to do for themselves what I was doing for myself and didn't know it meant anything. Mm -hmm. And this is what people, when, you know, for everybody who's listening, when you read quotes and you read things, inspirational messages that say, you know, take the first steps, you know, the, the, what you're looking for is on the other side of that. This is what they're talking about. You know, you start opening up and you start sharing your story and you start doing all that personal development work and you start looking into yourself and who you are as a person and what kind of life you want to create or co-create, as I say. So when you do all of this stuff, all of a sudden, it's like the pieces start to form in front of you because as you're talking and you're sharing and you're learning, and then hopefully you're teaching what you learn and you're looking for people to be of service to who are, you know, this is one of the best things I could have ever done was help people who are less fortunate than me. Talk about put your entire life into perspective. Yeah. Right. It's never as bad as you think it is, you know, for yourself until you start, you know, you start looking at other people's lives and help them get to where they want to go. Your entire world opens up. Everything changes. You know, you become a different person. All of a sudden you, you, you're useful. Your self-worth goes out of, you know, just goes out of this world because the confidence you get from being there for another human being is outstanding. Oh my God. You are just the, the when you see that your life has an impact, like yes, I work every day. When somebody walks through my door and is so down and sad and heavy, and I'm looking at it and I know that I will see them light and happy and thanking me and looking back and thanking me when we meet for the last time, mm -hmm. that is something that money cannot buy. Yeah. <laughs> No amount of money can give to your heart and soul the experience of seeing another human being walking away, feeling hopeful, ready with a spring in their foot because you have been present to them and they have walked through something. 
And you said something earlier that I want to go back on. The journey where, where you are may just feel like the darkest of the dark nights. Like you don't know where to put your foot. But trust me, whatever you're doing, just take one little step at a time. If it's listening to this podcast, if it is reading a book, if it is going outside and taking a walk, do that thing you know you can do. It may take months, it may take years, it may take whatever amount of time, but trust me, when you will look back and see how far you've come and see people smile because of something you've done, your self-worth, your confidence is going to fill up so much and you will just wonder why you didn't do it earlier. Mm. At least that's what I say to yeah. myself. But at the same time, I know that it's no, the timing was right. I had to be ready. I had to allow myself to get ready. And if you're not ready, it's nothing wrong. But just be where you are and know where you are. And know that taking the next step from where you are is the most important thing you'll ever do every single day. That's amazing. You've given me so much to think about. I'm going to be listening to this again and again, this recording. Oh, I am. And I know other people will too, because there's so much powerful stuff in here. (laughs) This is fantastic. I could listen to you speak for hours. I love it. I wanted to get to your free gift. You have this amazing free gift. Can we talk about that? Yes. Let's talk about it. Oh my God. What do you want to know? (laughs) Let's talk about what it is. So. I have created this meditation, Uh 10 minutes a day to reclaim your worthiness. Even if you feel you don't deserve anything good in life because of your divorce. This is especially, I put it together because worthiness, I have seen over and over and in my own experience that allowing ourselves to feel worthy to be alive, for me, it was feeling unworthy of everything. It was like, I don't know, it's an insidious disease and I see so much in my clients. Mm -hmm. And I know that when you're moving through transition, everything about you gets to be questioned. Like we said earlier, the dust is lifted from everything and it's blowing everywhere. Mm -hmm. And just being able to take 10 minutes a day and to just know that no matter how nasty or painful your process of divorce is. You can trust yourself one minute a day, 10 minutes a day to be on track to reconnect with you. And you will never go wrong doing that. All the fears, the hurts, all the terrible feelings that come up and just inviting you to really choose to start and to continue the process of letting go like we talked about. Just letting go. And it's just 10 minutes a day for you. You Mm -hmm. do so much for the world. You do so much for everyone. Take the 10 minutes a day and just listen. Just listen to this meditation. I opened my heart to the universe and I just said, pour it in. Mm -hmm. Gather it with all the people, all the ones who have walked the journey of reclaiming their worthiness. So that the people who listen to this 10 minutes a day can really rebuild and reintegrate. If there's something I want people to experience in the world is worthiness. I want a worthiness movement. Worthiness now, now and now. There's nothing to wait for. Mm-hmm. There's nothing to wait for. We can be worthy now. And this is what this meditation is meant to offer to you. And all you do is sit down, put your headphones on and listen. And just allow the instructions to lead you and to guide you to every cell in your body to receive this. And then I also created a PDF that has the paper version of it where you can just read it. And I think if you do it once or twice, you can already start to do it on your own. So that if you can't download your, your meditation, you can have your, head, your little cheat sheet for it and just go through it. And just allow yourself to know that your worthiness will never be in question. No matter how hard the struggle feels now, no matter how painful it is, no matter how guilty and shamed you are by your divorce, 
the worthiness has never been touched. And I want it to bubble up from within your soul and within the cells of your body and encourage you to take every step knowing that you are supported and loved. Mm, that's beautiful I love that and and can I make a suggestion too and I don't know if you intend your audio training to be like this but when I do any kind of guided meditation or anything instructional in this meditative state I always keep a pen and paper really close by because when I get to that moment where I have opened myself (laughs) that way all the things I need just come flooding in so yeah, so I so I either record them on my phone, like if if you have a voice recorder on your phone, or I write it down and I write furiously and then step right back into that space again. Mm, thank you for saying that out loud so you, your audience can hear. Actually, we're talking and I'm looking at a book right beside my table here where I write. Mm-hmm. Yes, I didn't include it in the meditation, but thank you for bringing it up because I think it's so important for people to write down what comes because when you, as you say, this opening, sometimes I do it because even the meditation things come and I write them down. And sometimes I finish my meditation and I take an extra minutes and say, now I'm just open to hear what it has to flow through. And mm-hmm. after about two, three minutes or five, it doesn't have to be very long. I stop and just write down whatever comes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I do the same thing. And I always ask at the end of every meditation, if it does, if the person who's doing the who's re, who's done the recording, if they don't ask me this at the end, I always ask myself, what 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 is this supposed to mean for me? What am I supposed to take away from this? What is my intention now for my day? And the answer comes to me every time. <laughs> So I just wanted to point that out too, because I think if we do this first thing in the morning, if we get up early enough to take the 10 minutes to love ourselves, which is really what you're doing when you're doing a meditation for yourself, you're loving yourself. It's a gift to you from you that this is what can start your entire day. And if you started off with such a positive, you know, soulful way, very intentional, then, then you're almost untouchable for the whole day, no matter what comes your way. You feel that shield of strength or courage around you. Oh, yes, that is so true. It's like, like you say, it's like this bubble you walk in. I, I remember one of the mornings I was going out and it had snowed and I had so many things. That I had trash to put in the trash bag and I had this. And I had so many things. And I finished doing this thing. So I turned around, Tanya, and the garage door opened. And my garage opener was in my pocket and I was trying to figure out how to get this garage opener out. Probably my hand passed by and touched it, but literally I turned around, I looked up and I looked around and I said, thank you, God, I know you opened it for me. (laughs) It was such a, like you said, it's just things that show up in the day Mm. when you really let the universe and let God lead your life that you're like, I can explain this. I have to say to people who want to understand it, like, I think my hand touched my pocket. (laughs) <laughs> I knew you opened that door for me. Oh, there are there are signs everywhere of everything. I feel like the answers are always right there in front of us. And for people who are listening who are skeptical, you can be skeptical. That's fine. That's cool. For a long time, I was pretty skeptical too. But then, you know, when I started to ask for direction and I started to ask for, you know, my, it wasn't that I needed to be shown anything. I needed to open myself up to the possibility. Mm-hmm. And once I opened myself up to the possibility these things would start popping up in my life everywhere. And it would make me smile because I'd think, oh my gosh, like I've been walking through this life blind. Like I've just been walking through this life for so long thinking, I got this. I know what I need to do. Nobody needs to help me. I don't need help. And then suddenly you open yourself, you know, you go through something hard enough, something traumatic enough. (laughs) And suddenly, you know, different parts of you start to change and you open yourself up in a way you never have before. There are literally signs everywhere. There is so many, so many of them and so much help. What I realized was life wants to serve me, but I felt so unworthy. I couldn't allow life to serve me. Mm-hmm. That's it right there. Yeah. I have to be cared for. You know, I was trying to squeeze myself into situations where I had in my head, oh, I'm supposed to care for other people, but nobody should care for me. Mm. How have I ever internalized that? And I feel like that happens to so to every human and we have to go open ourselves up to our own worthiness so we can really receive 
because life is there to cater to us. I couldn't explain how my garage door was open when I was trying to figure out how to do all these things mm. in the morning. And I was like, I get help. And so many things <laughs> I'm going through and I'm just like, thank you. Yeah, that gratitude has to be there for sure. Indeed. I hear it. I can see there the help. I can hear it. I'm leaving the house and I remember something. And I'm like, oh, I could have forgotten that. And then I would have to stress out about it. And it's like right at the door, I remember it and I go and pick it out. Yes, there is so much in the universe ready to care for us. But I think we're just deceived by what we see, what we hear, what we've been taught. And some of us are really just afraid to open up to anything else. Mm. That goes right back down to that belief system again, right? Because that's, that's exactly what we're doing. It's almost like we... We have so much unlearning to do so that we can learn the right way to live, right? We have to, we have so much unlearning to do so that we can be soulful humans and not humans just bumbling around waiting for the next thing to come along. Gosh, to unlearn the questions about what is life about? Mm -hmm. Because maybe we didn't ask the question directly, but somebody answered it for us and gave us an answer that is not serving us, but we don't know that we can ask the question again and look for answers because they are. Ooh, there are books, there are people out there teaching us this is how the universe works, this is how physics works, this is how spirit works, this is how life works. But we are all like boxed into small pieces and squares of information we've gathered. Oh, yeah, life, my body is sick here, I'm supposed to be all there, I'm feeling this pain there, and useless there, you know? Bringing mm -hmm. <laughs> the stuff in and believing it throughout. And never stopping to say, really, is this a point? Is this why I'm here? Yeah. And what you're saying is, let's open up ourselves and really ask, what is my life about? What am I hungry for? You can't be hungry for something if you can't access it. I've said this to some of my clients. None of us sitting here is trying to get to, into space, right? I'm not worried about the next air <laughs> to go to space because that's within, not within my reach. But I'm worthy about worried about things that I can reach. I'm worried about having a good apartment to live in, a good house to be in, because those are things that are open and available to me. That's why I'm longing for them. The people who are longing for the aircraft to go to space are there. That is where their desires are going because they have already achieved that kind of level. Mm -hmm. For all of us who are still on our journeys, open your heart to your next desire. And don't shut yourself down and don't shame yourself away and don't guilt yourself away. Mary, this has been such an amazing interview with you. I, you know, we talked about so much stuff. There's so much great stuff in here for people to listen to. And I want to remind everybody, this interview is going to be here forever. So, you know, if you want to keep going back to this all week long, you can do that. Please do that. Have it start your day or have it be the start of a weekend for you so that you're not losing days doing things you shouldn't be doing you know, and really focus and give your, your, your weekend or your week some real intention and some real juice, right? So Mary, I'm going to end the interview now. This was unbelievably beautiful. You're such a beautiful soul. Thank you so much for bringing everything you brought today. Thank you so much for this space that you've provided for women who so need it. It's so powerful. And I am going to be raving about it and inviting every woman I know that will need it to watch it. Amazing. Well, they're going to love your interview for sure. I can say that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so important, so necessary, so needed. Well, thank you, Mary. Thank you so much. And thank you to everybody. You're listening to Thriving After Divorce Radio. I am your host, Tanya Marie Dubé, and we will see you same time next week, same time, same place. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Mary. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you again so, so, so much for joining us on the Thriving After Divorce radio podcast. We're coming to you every Monday morning so that you can start your week with intention and some powerful advice for what you're dealing with. So please subscribe to this podcast and share it with your friends and your family. My goal is to help change 1 million lives with this work because when you teach a woman, you teach an entire community. Everybody benefits and the love spreads. So please feel free to comment, review, share, and like with your help. I know I can reach this goal. So have a beautiful day and we will see you next week.